Hi, everyone. Welcome to Wandering DMs. I'm Paul. And I'm Dan. And on today's episode, we have a very special guest, Mr. Griffith Morgan III, who's the head of the Secrets of Blackmore project. He likes to keep things secret uh, until just the right time. Uh, and he's here today to talk about the next printing of The Lost Dungeons of Tonnesburg by famed Blackmore player Greg Svensson. And uh, you're seeing what we all have copies. We all have hardcover copies of this gorgeous, uh, this gorgeous initial printing, which is, uh, which is currently out of print. But uh, there's a new printing coming up, and if you didn't get it the first time around, it will be available soon. And uh, Griff, thank you so much for making time uh, for you in this gorgeous book today. Yeah, I'm just going to be back here. I'm going to hide the whole show. <laughs> <laughs> we have um, a number of creators who like to be very private about that, so we respect that. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I think that's silly. It's just like you got to just, you know, people are people. Um, here I am in all my 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 uh, smelly wonder, but you can't smell me over the internet, so you're safe. Um, um, LSR, old smelly reprobates, right? Um, <laughs> so yeah, I'm just glad I, to be I, on the show. You know, I hope we have a lot of fun here. Um, I'm really great. proud of this book. You know, I'm glad you guys. You know, I sent you guys copies like what a year ago. I sent you guys yep, copies yep. when nobody cared and they weren't worth anything. Um, <laughs> one of those sold for over five hundred dollars on eBay now. So you've got like between the two of you, wow. like over a thousand dollars in your hands. And uh, those are amazing. beautiful, actually. That's probably the best gift anyone has ever sent the Wandering DMs. If anybody wants to try to top well, that, feel free. But I don't. I think you're gonna have a hard time, frankly. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just like you know, it wasn't it wasn't planned as a as a tiny printing. These are these are a small printing too. Um, um, but it just ended up that way. So they're kind of a rarity that people want to have, you know? Um, so yeah, what did you want to talk about? Anything particular? I mean, you guys read well, the book. Is there anything that sticks out? Well, you know, we had, um, uh, you know, we had, we had in the spring, we had Dan Bog, Dan Boggs, uh, who wrote the, uh, the rule set at the mm -hmm. back of this. So you can play the whole game. If, you know, if you'd never had D and D or anything like that, Plus Greg Spenson, who wrote the original adventure, of course. So that was a very right. interesting chat. So you told us that um, there's a new Kickstarter that you're about to uh, launch. Is that right? Yeah. Is that going to be like this week or, or soon after that? You know, we're hoping this week. Um, there's a whole process you have to go to. Anybody that through anybody that's done a Kickstarter knows that you have to get it approved. And however busy they are leads to some delay there. But... Um, the last thing we're working on, we're going to do, we weren't sure about it, but uh, we thought we'd try doing a conversion for the dungeon level keys to 5e, just because so many people play 5e. And maybe, I'm thinking of putting a guide in there of what 5e rules to not use. Um, so like extended rests and uh, what are the other ones? Just, you know, try to avoid all the die rolls, try to role play it all interact with the environment and you know in the in the full role playing experience which is not just play acting role playing is is you being immersed in a in a in a in a fantasy where you can use all your senses to experience what your what is around you by based on what the dm tells you and uh and then what you say is what you do you know um i mean we all know that but uh, I think that's a different, I think that 5e is not being played in the traditional way. And so I think people need to, hopefully this will be a good guide for them to get back to playing in a traditional manner. I can see a lot of tension there between, uh, you know, current fifth edition or shortly sixth edition rules. Um, and, you know, an adventure that was really written, uh, I think, you know, before D&D &D was published even initially, I think he was looking at like, yeah. you know, Greg was looking at a draft document before D&D &D was on the market. He and probably had a draft. D&D yeah. was released, I always forget, it was like May of 74 or something like that, or maybe it was earlier, I don't know, but um, I'm not like a date a date freak, and, you know, I don't care. It happened, all I care is that it happened and, and the ideas behind something happening or what's relevant to me. Um, so, yeah, he had it about eight months before, and probably the draft he had was fairly, uh, it might have been a lot different, you know, we don't know. Um, yeah. I don't know. Did Dan talk about the stocking of the dungeon at all when he was on the show? Because he went did, through yeah, and analyzed the numbers. Yeah. So it yeah, looks Dan like it was done. Day. Yeah. I mean, I ran it when I got a hold of it. Once I knew what it was, we knew what it was actually before 
it was confirmed. It was just like, this is the only thing it can be. Um, yep. And it was McGarry who suggested that it was probably Thomas Borg and that he didn't realize he had kept a Xerox copy of the maps uh, and that he had made before he went to Boston and lost the maps for Greg. Um, and so it just sat in a box for 35 years. So I, the minute I got those scans, I started running it for our group. And uh, it was kind of remarkable because there's things that I'd forgotten about original Dungeons and Dragons. The encounters are not, Arneson never ran balanced encounters. The original Blackmore, if you look at the first fantasy campaign, you know, there are rooms, like there are rooms with 500 orcs in them. You know? <laughs> like you open the door and it's just, oh, okay, this is yeah. where we run. Drop yeah. everything, move, leave treasure, leave everything of value, just lighten up and move. <laughs> and um, uh, anyway, so the the original D and D had the com the encounter charts. It were sort of uh, double charts. You'd use them for placing monsters randomly. And you'd use them for random encounters, and um, and most people didn't use. I, mean, I, you know, I would just look at it and go like, you know, this room is a temple. I think this should be here, and I would take something off of the first level, um, or something that seemed balanced, or something on the third a third level monster, and not as many, so it was a balanced sort of balanced encounter for my players. Um, but the original rules, you had to, you'd roll a die first to see what level of monster you got. And it was always the level you were on or worse. It never was easier. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. And so yeah. if you look at the, the first level, and then the other trick, well, first we'll talk about that, and then I'll tell you about the other sneaky <laughs> trick about the Um If you look at the first level, I mean, it was fun running my players through it because they were just like, Chris immediately, he was like, this, this is, you know, he was like, this is Thomas Borg, isn't it? Even the first session, he was like, you're Thomas Borg. And I was like, yep. And so he was just like, oh my God, we're like the first people in like, you know, 35 or more years to go into this dungeon. It's, this is historical. Um, but room number one. Chris is, two, uh, Chris's full name is what again? Chris Graves. Yep. And he works, yeah. he's worked on the production with you, I think, since then? Yeah. He's, he's, I mean, he, he did all the layout. Um, he does a lot of the like the detail finish work, um, like you know, just everything that you see in the layout. He went. He was the one who said, "Let's make this look exactly like the Dungeon Master's Guide from AD and D." And he went and because um, he has publishing experience, so he went. And he measured the size of the the font because people keep saying like the font's so tiny, and it's like, yeah, when you were twelve, it wasn't. You were fourteen, right. it wasn't. <laughs> it is now. Um, <laughs> oh no. But yeah, like, um, here, let me find a page with that first. Since we're talking about it, I mean, yes. these charts here, uh, boop, 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 are there charts there? Charts. Yeah, somewhere yeah, there are charts. Way. Okay, yeah, but you see those charts. Those Anybody who played AD&D is like, wait a minute, that looks like TSR product. And so <laughs> the, the format is exactly the format of the, the DMG. So it's very reminiscent for anybody from that era. If you're an AD and D player, you're like, oh my God, this is like, I'm coming home again after, you know, four years or whatever. Um, but the cool thing is that if you go to uh, the first level, I mean, you guys have your books there, pop those books open and look at that first level map. Um, it, there's a, a rooms one and two, numbered one and two. Uh, room number one, I believe it is, has whites in it. And then and the room next door yeah. to it and i so i think that greg was rolling up monsters but i also think he was placing them in in sort of reasonable relationships you know my like people have commented that the book the dungeon seems chaotic and random and it's like no room number one has wraiths in it and next and next door um what is it room or room number two i mean mm -hmm. room number one room number one has um some uh, a theurgist yep. and, uh, magic user and his henchman. Fighter. Yeah, magic user. So clearly there's some relationship between these evil creatures. Like, the, you know, the, 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 the wraiths have a relationship there. Even though they're evil wraiths, they've met this evil magic user and his henchmen, and they're kind of teaming up because they're right next. You know, there's no way they could exist together, right? 
And um, and I, I think uh, I think we were just talking about this in our last episode about slimes. Was it not yeah. Greg who told us the story of like the first ever encounter in yeah. uh, Blackmore no. was a bunch yeah. of first levels against a black pudding, which is yeah, just... great pudding back then. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Great, which is like, among the worst that's monsters in, in classic D and D. It's it still is. Yeah, or maybe and it's. I mean, are any monsters evil in Five E? I have to mock Five E. It's just so nerfed. You know, it's like, <laughs> how can you feel scared and engaged when you just go think? Okay, next encounter. You know, if if I recall correctly, I mean, so I looked this up for our our show about that, and to my to my surprise, the thing that they did with Black Pudding is that. Uh, of course, we all know that it wants to destroy your equipment and armor, right? That's one of the main things. Right. And so fifth edition is the first edition where they said, yep, wants to destroy your armor, but doesn't have any effect on magic stuff. And right. I was like, boy, right. that's a big, that's a big uh, safety bumper there. That was the whole well, point at one point. Yeah, but it also has a really serious acid-like effect on people, anything mm -hmm. organic. So uh, right. it was just a good way to like, okay, if, if you manage to kill it, if you can get rid of it, then you get the magic items that are hidden inside of it. It's, you know, it's the bait, right? Um, but did they mention where it comes from? Uh, like it... I, I, you should tell us. You should tell us. Okay. For our, for our <laughs> it comes from Arson says he was watching old monster movies, old black and white movies, when he came up with the idea for the dungeon. And so um, we're pretty sure, well, all the guys say that, that he based it on the blob from the original black and white movie of the blob. Yeah. So in a way, a gray pudding makes sense because on the screen, you couldn't have just a black thing. It was like this gray amorphous thing it was the blob, right? <laughs> Um, we uh, we opened our show we opened our show with a clip uh, so having having had Greg tell us that we opened our show uh, two weeks ago with a clip uh, from the Blob, and okay. um, I, I forgot that was the first that was the first movie that starred um, Steve McQueen. Is that right? If I am I did I is that do I have that right? It? I don't know. Yeah, it was, I mean, some, it was, it was some famous fun. actors for starring rule. I I think it was uh, think yeah it was McQueen actually. Um, but, and that's, that's that whole like combo of sci-fi and and fantasy yes. and gothic horror, yes. you know. Uh, um, that's the thing I always emphasize is like you're not running, you know, this isn't just an ordinary place. You're not walking through a hallway in a in an office building. <laughs> you are underground in a terrifying place, and weird things happen. And and uh, uh, you know, you go down the passageway and you're hearing whispering voices and somebody feels something touch their hair and they're, you know, what is it? And you have to part cobwebs and you have to create this environment for your players and get them, you know, and you ask them for saving throws, but there's nothing there. It's just like, give me a saving throw. And they're like, Oh, you know? And so you create this feeling. And so when I, when I was running, what I wanted to get to was when I ran the um, first few sessions of uh, um, Tonisborg, I mean, the, the, the brutality of the dungeon was amazing and, and and part of it was that the players got into situations there are toads on the first level and i didn't know how to you know i statted them kind of like ad and d so they were these four hit dice things and they move fast and they chomp hard and uh they lost so many characters in the toad room in on, on level that might be level two but um on level one they got to the wraiths and it was like okay let's send the thief down we'll have thief listen at the doors and so the thief listens at the far door and doesn't hear anything because it's undead right so then the fighter goes down and they knock the door open and suddenly it's like oh oh crap we're first level players these are wraiths they're like four hit die monsters their chances of hitting us are like you know really good we're done for so they bolt for it but they don't you know they still get one attack as they're running away and uh and the thief got the death touch and it's just like and missed his saving throw and lost his level of experience and, and crumpled on the floor and the fighter was just like, I'm out of here. Um, <laughs> and so that, I mean, that's, it was just like epic old D and D where the players go in thinking they're badasses and they open a door and they're like, oh, right. So, and they just, you know, they just fought a bunch of evil high priests and they were like, uh, they were already thrashed. Like the the adventure, I think, lasted four rooms or something that day. It just happened to work out that way. Um, we 
we we have that experience a lot and our friend max has a good story even with the 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 keep on you know gygax's keep on the borderlands he's had new players and maybe they've played fifth edition before and they just assume that they can take on anything you know in small batches and they quickly right. you know they have their first tpk and i to for me i feel like one of the really really great things about watching players learn old school to see them get better real fast they take they take the lesson and then they come in and very rapidly they're much better players and they're more they're more cautious and they're more strategic and they're more cunning and they're more diabolical frankly and i i personally get my jollies off seeing my players get better real fast because they have to it makes you play better <laughs> right when you when yeah. you realize that you can't just go tromping in there and do whatever and you just like roll the dice and win and you go to the next thing it's like no, you could, the whole party could get TPK'd uh, in the first room. My first dungeon DMing experience, I basically TPK'd a party in a room full of giant rats in uh, Xenopus Dungeon. They decided to go north, and then they went a little bit west, and they came to the giant rat room, and that was it. I was just rolling so hot, you know? It was just like, yep. 18! The fighters, I mean, the AC2 fighters were down, and... The rest of the party was like, oh, crap, you know, and it was like four giant rats is all. Now, for me in that same dungeon, it was the giant spider. So me running the, the exact okay. same dungeon was my first dungeon and had a player going to the giant spider room, which which it was actually Gygax who cranked it up compared to what Holmes put in there and oh, really? wiped out. Okay. Wiped out the party, and there's a right right after that. There's a dead end room. So the one the one character who is still alive says, I escaped from the out. store, right? Ran right. into the dead end room. And we 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 paused we pa we we permanently paused the game at that point. So now, forty years later, as far as we know, he's still in he there waiting. Out, maybe he didn't. But yeah, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, if the spider was already eaten a lot, it might just ignore him. You know, he might have gotten maybe, by yeah. if he just waited till he right. got done munching a little bit. Yeah. That's hilarious. I feel like the other though. thing that happens is when you start as, as as a younger person, when you start out, like it didn't even occur to me to fudge the dice. It was like, here's the rules, and I'm very literal, and bam, bam, yeah. bam, and the whole party goes down, and that's what the book says. And uh, it's it's interesting to over the years to kind of contend with how much you're going to fudge the fudge the dice with. Yeah. So um, I don't know. I mean, it was exciting to be running the dungeon. Um, my party. The other thing was that they sort of lost track players. Get excited when they find stairways a lot of dungeons are designed uh sort of in a linear fashion it's like clear level one and then there's a stair at the end and you go down to the next level it's like a video game this thing has got uh stairways everywhere and if you've got adventurous players like i do um they took a stairway from like the second level I, or no it was from the first level i think there's a stairway on the first level that goes down to like yep. the fourth level um yep and uh, and what's cute about this dungeon is that the actual the main entrance there are a couple entrances and if you are guided um, to the main entrance you start on the second level so your first level players on the second level <laughs> so you're already screwed right. and then you take right. a stairwell uh, they took a stairwell down to the fourth level and they'd found a magic wand which I determined was flawed and so it was like the the wand of I think I told you about the wand of flower balls. And, and yes. fur balls, yeah. Yes. So they're like, so tell us again. And they ran tell into, us again. What does that do exactly? Oh, yeah. oh, it's just a wand. Like I gave him a stick, and it said "wand of" like with a sharpie. I wrote "wand of," oh, and then some <laughs> scribbles. Like so, and they're so they see it, and they're like, "wand of fireballs, yay!" And it's like I roll a die on a one or a two, it's fireballs. Three or four, it's a uh, flower balls. Just petunias go spraying everywhere. And um, you have to wade through them, though. And then the last one is, is fur balls, like a giant. It's like, like the wand is like, oh, <laughs> oh, and it shoots a giant, like, cat puke. Yeah, it's disgusting. I know, it's disgusting. But um, so they were down there, and they ran into, they wandered, they took the stairs, and now they, they have no clue they're down on maybe the sixth level of the dungeon or the fourth level. I mean, they're down there, they're first levels. And they, the first thing they run into is a black pudding. So the wizard's like, I got it taken care of. I got the wand. <laughs> and he fires petunias all over the, the, the black pudding. And um, all they really did was run away and run back to the stairs and go back up to the, the upper levels at that point. Yeah. They were just like, 
like this is a really bad place um <laughs> but i do a lot Call of me. you know could you pull up the the image uh, the slice of the sixth level that uh, comes out of sample document so oh, uh, yeah. so, this, so this is out of your sample document there and it's like half of the sixth level there hopefully we're not giving away too many spoilers pretty i'm pretty sure oh, everybody that fine. watches this show is a dm frankly i so so it's so the players right, right. probably get inflicted on this by dms running tonisborg but yeah there's a lot of there's a lot of interconnections so i think that all of those little grids with little slices in it are stairs i think and, yeah and see uh, that the m down on the bottom the lower yep. right that so that's a shaft, shaft going through multiple levels right it's got stone stone like kind of like a ladder stone ladder built into the side you can climb all the way down to the 10th level you know but the thing about this dungeon is like you see i don't know if this sample shows any curved stairs but there are a lot of stairs that will on one level they're curved and on the next level they're straight and so you have to really imagine that these things are about 50 feet. I'm like, I was talking to somebody else about this on another show, like um, the original, um, the original uh, uh, Underworld and Wilderness Adventures. Um, it has sort of a, a profile view of what a dungeon should look like. And so you have to imagine it that these, these spaces between the levels are at least 50 feet. This is not a modern apartment building this is like an ancient place and in fact you know we would draw like long long ramp passages so the players didn't notice that they were like going down a level and stuff like that to trick them right um um so yeah i mean there's a uh so yeah going down you know you're going to go down a thousand feet to go down that shaft and then you're in a really bad place because you're on the 10th level and it's there are like Balrogs everywhere. It's just Balrog heaven, you know, and fire. There's a sign of I fire giants are down there, like bathing in lava. Like there's a there's a lot of somewhere in this this map here. This is only the sixth level, but the, one of the rooms that we're looking at has a Balrog in it. And I'm not going to tell tell people who, where yeah. it is, but um, yeah. you know this this slice right here has a Balrog and a horrible ochre jelly and trolls and a wizard and stuff like that. Um, when we had, you know, when we had Greg on, he he did say that to his recollection, most of Tonisborg was relying on random rolls, and he said that uh, the layout yeah. uh, was a series of tables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said he had a series of tables from Dave Arneson, mm -hmm. and apparently those tables are, are are lost, which which I which I'm personally sad about. But the interesting thing is, um, you know, at one point in the distant past, I made a computer program to randomly generate 3D dungeons. And uh -huh. for whatever reason, it wound up, you know, highly interconnected. And there was like lots of things down and lots of things up. And there were places that to access them, right. you had to come in, right. you had to go down over and then back up was like the only way to get to parts of the first level. Um, and it, this was very reminiscent, I think, of those systems that, um, and I, I think it's really interesting and intriguing and puzzly in a way that I wouldn't, if I was designing it myself by hand, I wouldn't come up with all those inter interconnections. And I think it's really interesting to have them and to have yeah. this, you know, part of the challenge navigating the whole up, down, and a lot of freedom to get yourself in trouble. Well, and that, you know, like if you want to go over here in the dungeon, it might be easy, you know, like we know we've been down here, we've got a lot of it mapped. We know that the Balrog and like 50 orcs are over there because we, we were like, we're not going to go there. So we can, you know, maybe it's safer if we go down to the eighth level and take some hallways and then come up back up in the seventh or sixth level and go to this other area of it, you know. Um, the hallways really should be like highways around the dungeon. They shouldn't just be uh, lead from room to room to room. Mm -hmm. um, um, I mean, people talk about dungeon ecology, and I guess there's some whole modern. I mean, we thought about that stuff back, I remember being, 15 or 16 and thinking like, well, is it reasonable to have this many creatures here? And, and then realizing, well, yeah, because otherwise the dungeon is going to be really boring and we want to have fun, you know? Um, all that, I mean, all that stuff. I even remember thinking about like, gee, we're going into places and murdering people. <laughs> this is not very wholesome. It's like, okay, it's just a game, you know, we're just going to do this. It's fun. <laughs> not hurting anybody. Um, but, um, yeah, I don't know. The, 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 the dungeon is fantastic. I mean, running it 
as a as a dungeon master, I added passages. I added there were places where I didn't really have a lot of guidance at the time, and so I would just do my own interpretation of what was there. Um, and I added passages. There are like these te temples to these like evil gods down there that I've added in. Um, there's a, you know I, they call it I hate the term Gonzo, but um, humorous humorous stuff. Like I have the magic door named Isidore. And uh, Isidore, you open Isidore and you end up in, an, like, you're not in the dungeon anymore. You're in this other dimension. And there's several dimensions, depending upon whether you turn the knob this way, whether you push or pull. And, uh, oh, no. It's, you know, so yeah, Isidore is a great place to find, but you got to go down to, like, the sixth level to get to Isidore. And you've got, by then, you've, like, been brutalized by everything. But, um, um, what else? I don't know. It's just, it was just exciting to run it. And, and know that we were sort of making this sort of like we were doing something that was historically relevant as far as RPGs. We were reviving this ancient dungeon that nobody had ever seen. Hardly anybody had ever seen. Um, I think the only people that might have seen the maps were Dave Arneson probably saw the maps, um, Greg Svensson and maybe David McGarry. Everybody else just saw fragments from playing in the dungeon. And um, if you've seen... Uh, the have you seen McGarry's character matrix? Like twenty I characters on, on two sides of I a have. piece of paper. I um, think I reposted on my blog a while back. Yeah, there are some players on there there that are, you know, they died in Tonisborg. It says where they died. It says Tonisborg. So we know, like, like in McGarry's uh, character sheet, he's got twenty characters, and they're all from somewhere between about nineteen seventy one to 1973 you know maybe not really so i think he left the twin cities before maybe before 74 um so we have a like a real insight into this and here's this dungeon that's one of the first places where like he lost his his character and he he distinctly remembers that he lost his character to a hydra and there's only one hydra in there so we know that that's the room where McGarry lost his character. It was in this dungeon there. That's, so that's actually in the slice that we're looking at right now. So, uh, and it's a lovely little detail in the book, actually. So that's actually uh, area sixteen, which is the uh -huh. uh, big room on the right, yeah. actually. Um, yeah. And you've got you've got that in the book here. It goes a bit of history. Greg ran a session of Tonisburg for Dave McGarry, uh, which one of David's favorite characters in the early days, the Scholarist. Met her end fighting a seven-headed hydra single-handedly. That's that's courageous. That's either courageous yeah. or foolhardy. And um, <laughs> as as this is the only room in the dungeon with seven-headed hydra, it seems certain that this is the room where the scholarist died. So referees may find it fun to include the scholaress's remains in the room of contents. Not much more than a skeleton. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe you know you can gather the bones and see if you can have them like. Uh... You know, there's a there's several there's resurrection, but there's also regeneration. So maybe you could regenerate with the bones and revive the scholar's character. Oh. You know, Great. yeah. Great. Um, um, I don't know. It's 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 a lovely lovely dungeon. Uh, the V the V areas. I use letter V. Dan was like, "Why'd you use V?" And it's like, "Well, it's lava. It's volcanic." But the V areas are like. Uh, there are these shafts that go through about four levels. And so on the top, they're just rising hot air and noxious gases and things. But if you were to fall in, you'd fall all the way to the 10th level. But at the 10th level, it's a lava pit. It's like a pit with lava at the bottom of it. And so you'd fall into this pool of lava, and that, that's bad. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, so they're kind of, it's interesting because they're all, it's so vertical like that. Um, I put encounters, a lot of times I put encounters in the stairwells, like there'll be something written on the wall or the, I even put, uh, little, uh, landings inside the stairwells when I run it. So the, my players will go down like 20 feet and then they'll come to a landing, which is almost like a room. And there might be somebody there they encounter or who knows what, or a trap or something. And, uh, and I like to just fill the, you know, I, the book we talk you read the part about like just dungeon decor and using like uh the environmental elements like like even like sort of micro weather environments of like rain or fog or you know you're going down a passage and it's just it's so humid it's just dripping with water as you go through or 
where you go through some area and that's it's very cold so instead of being drippy with water it's got like icicles and floors slippery and um or there might be a lot of fog like it's just it cre- you know the middle of the room has sort of a, a natural like perfect humidity and temperature to create a fog bank in the middle of the room and you don't know what's in there um that kind of stuff um we talk a lot about that in the book uh, is, is sort of decorating it most dungeons you just look at the map and you can't really know what's there and so we talk a lot about we don't know what was there aside from greg's notes i think if you look at the uh the map levels his original maps they might say like there's on level one there's one area and it says wet area and it's where the there are some toads i think down that secret passage um and so when my players ran into the wet area yeah it's level one when my players ran into the wet area uh, which is room number four i described how there were mushrooms growing all over the walls and some of them were essent and and uh chris's character Mm, these might be useful. I'm a wizard, right? So he picked a bunch of mushrooms in the first hallway and uh, stashed them, thinking they might use them. You know, he might use them to make potions or cast spells or something. You don't know. Something I'd have to think of later with him. But, right, um, totally. Um, but there's nothing in there to say that, right? It's just like that's, that's what the DM does, is you add, you add to the experience. Um, Anyway, going very right. very improvisational. It can be a very improvisational. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, know, you slow that. down to look at your environment. It's not like you're just marching through. Like we fill the thing, we go through the next thing. You know, um, very. It's uh, the, the you have to create that sense of exploration, and you have to slow players down and make them aware that there could be traps anywhere. That's the other thing I add in is is traps in places that aren't on the maps and things like that. Um, my bad guys are really partial to taking uh, humans that they capture and flaying them and creating just curtains that they hang in the hallways made out of human flesh with faces and hands and stuff sewn into them. And that's always a delightful thing to just creep out your players with. Um, and it also creates a barrier you can't see through. So it's like at the 10 foot people and like, what's back there? You know, something jumps out at you. Um, so this is the point in every episode where Dan points out that D&D is essentially a horror game at its root. That's what um, I've been telling everybody. I mean, I have a whole blog post about that. You know, D&D is gothic horror, right? It's, yeah. it's, mm-hmm. it's all the things that, that go bump in the night and scare you. And, um, and then I talk like, I don't know, that we talk a lot about technique. Like players get used to the things that go bump in the night. So then they learn to like deal with the things in front of them. And it's like, yeah. But then you put something in front of them that lures them in and you have the thing that drops off the ceiling onto their head, you know, or something. Um, and, and I don't know, you just, uh, the deflection move, you create situations with deflection. So the players have to be more careful. My players, every, every door they open, they're like, hey, is there anything on the ceiling? <laughs> they're like, you know, Griff, Griff socks. And there's going to be something on the ceiling or, you know, it's like Griff is out to kill us. And it's like, I'm not really out to kill them, but it's like, yeah, if it happens, you know, I will rub my hands together with glee when you fall for a trap. Um, but um, I feel like you have to, uh, you have to, you have to lean into the kayfabe, um, uh of uh, even if, you know, frankly, it hurts. Personally, it hurts me when a player character dies. But I in in game I have to play the DM character and and right uh, you and have to act like that's yeah. not act like that's not the case because I feel that's bad the, when I when, you know players die yeah but that's right? why I give everybody two characters and run huge parties you know like um, I think I talked about this on the last show it's like when I go to Gary Con everybody gets a character I run groups of twelve players through Thomas Borg and. When they lose characters, like I don't know, I ran I ran a group through Thomas Borg where one guy the he was running the Hobbit, and he was too rash and fell into a pit and died with a bunch of skeletons, and uh, which isn't part of the key for them. It's like a special area I designed for my Thomas Borg. You should you know you get the book and you make your Thomas Borg, um, but um, so the next thing I knew, everybody was like, he should play the mule. So <laughs> the halflings playing the mule, right? Um, and that was, 
<laughs> you know, and it was great because the mule actually was sort of a, a MacGuffin. It was not just a mule. It was extra smart. And it had the, the ability to smell treasure. And so uh, it was perfect to be able to hand that off instead of having it be like sort of an NPC that I would run and let a player be, become a mule. Um, so he was happy because he got, you know, it's not like he was out of the game. He got another character that he could uh, be irresponsible with. You know. And Paul, that's that's similar to what you do like at a convention game now, right? I definitely always run with, with spare characters, uh, you know, on the side, mm -hmm. right, to bring in after the fact. Um, and I kind of just hand wave them showing up. I mean, it sounds like if you're talking about characters, I guess I'm curious, actually, if you say if you have two characters per player, are they are all the characters present and they're jumping back and forth between them or are they bringing them in? Oh, well, like if I have, needed. if I'm running a, my, the house group, we yeah. ranges between like um, six and eight people. Well, last time, maybe four to eight, depends on who shows up. Some people are running two characters. Some people are running one character. Um, for a while, like Paul and Rosa seemed to alternate. So Paul would just run Rosa's characters when she wasn't there and she'd run them when he was there. Or if they both showed up, they'd each just take one of the characters and run them. Um, so they, I mean, it's just, you know, we're pretty magnanimous and just like, here, have my character. You can run this, you know, like I got the magic user. Here's the fighter. You can run the fighter. And then, um, um, like in conventions, I have the mule, you know, there's, there are other critters in the party that may not seem like they could be characters, but if we need to have an extra character, there's no reason why the dwarf's pet rat doesn't get to be, you know, somebody doesn't get to be the pet rat if they get killed. They don't get, you know, they can, they can still play and, you know, it's like, I mean, the rat would be the perfect snoop to like send the rat down the hallway or, you know, to listen and see if they can find out anything about what's down there and come back and, you know, and then they can be like, you know, you were, you were, that would be great. You, you were talking about traps uh, that you added a second ago and actually there's a yeah. really good um, question by one of our viewers I'm going to throw up on screen here. So. Um, Joshua Macy uh, was asking exactly how do you run the traps? Um, I'm presuming not just save to avoid damage. So, like when a trap springs, do you roll to see if it springs? Because that's in the original book at one point. I usually just, do that. Is it just what automatic I do is, damage? Do they get saving throws? Is it ability checks? I like well, like traps spring on a one or a two, right? So on in OD and D, um, and so to me that means like if it doesn't spring, like the person maybe didn't step on the you know, didn't break the trip wire. They didn't step on the tile that triggers it. And so it's like the next person in line. <laughs> I mean, it's like right. a lottery, you know, as you go through the passage, who gets the spear through the head? Um, um, I ran a demo and one of the guys caught the spear. Actually, the guy had retired. And so the other players were running his character. And I was like, why don't you make his characters go through the door first? And, and you know, he got the one to two on the first time through. And was impaled on the spear kind of Indiana Jones style. And, um, so yeah, I do that, you know, um, um, I mean the traps I kind of do, I, I kind of have dialed them back a little bit cause I hate killing characters on a trap. So like on the first and second level, the traps might be half a D six damage. So most of the time you're not, um, harming a character. Um, I have some home rules like like hit points, you know, if you have a high constitution, what I do is I, I average your constitution into the die roll. So like you cannot roll less than a certain amount. Like if you're an average character with an 11, you cannot roll less than a three or four on your hit dice because your constitution is high, stuff like that to kind of bring the character, the PCs up a little bit. Um, but at the same time, it's kind of fun to have PCs that have just one hit point and watch them go through. Um, the rules, I mean, even the rules on hit points, talk about vagueness in rules. When I first read the, the original D&D, &D, I was curious about whether you got to re-roll your hit points before each adventure session, because it wasn't very clear. And I was like, well, it seems kind of sucky that you, you know, like you roll a one and you're always a one, right? Maybe next time you're like, because the hit points are kind of like a luck system. Maybe your biorhythms are good this week and you get to re-roll and you six. <laughs> Last week, you know, maybe you'd had a cold or something, and you were—you only had one hit point. But, um, but back to the trap thing. Yeah, when I run traps, it's a die roll to see if you if you trigger it. 
Um, mm -hmm. I do a lot of little uh, little traps that don't do a lot of damage, but uh, cause the players to get worn down. Um, I hate to do the like you know you you fall in the pit to your death sort of stuff. Um, not that I haven't done it, not that I haven't had it done to me. Yeah. Um, you know, the main thing with the traps is that players, most traps that I rig up, you know, it's, it's, you figure the main hallways are heavily traversed by these creatures wandering through. And, and so any traps that are there are, are going to be pretty basic, like a pit with spikes in the bottom or something like that. The, the really lethal stuff. The minute you go through a secret door, you're in a hidden ancient place. Like maybe it's a tomb or a temple or, you know, I mean, that's the thing about the, the mega dungeons are, are sort of like, um, trying to think, you know, it's like the Fibonacci, like the very recursive, you've got this main thing, but then there are these little things and then there are these little things mm -hmm. and little things. And, like a fractal. And, yeah. They're very much like a fractal. So like you go into the temple and you find the big, First, we go through the secret door, we find the temple, or maybe it's just obvious. Then we find a secret door, we find the hidden antechamber where they do the really spooky stuff. And then somebody sees something on the floor and we realize that we can lift that slab up, but now we're in the tomb complex. Then we're in the tomb complex and we find a, a crypt and in the wall, you know, if you're lucky, you find a little secret door into the real crypt where the real treasure is. So, you, you know, you, you, let, you can let me play things. devil's advocate. Uh, per, so personally, I love that kind of fractal wheels and wheel, wheels within wheels. Let me just play devil's advocate for a second because I've seen so a counter choose. argument, right? That's I, so I've seen people counter argue of like if if the interesting stuff is behind secret door one two three four and it's hard to get to, the players might not get to it, and yeah, isn't that wasted content? And and no. and shouldn't we shouldn't we make the game about the thing the game's about? What's what's the response I don't care to about that? the players? I just have fun making my dungeons. <laughs> like and i I read there was I think both Gary and Dave talked about A and B switching, where they would make a dungeon and if there was like a really interesting thing over here, right? Um, they would just like move it <laughs> if the players went over there and it's like, eh, let's put it over there, you know. Um and so they encounter it anyway. Like I had a dungeon where I had this really wonderful hidden room. The players never found it. And I was like, I'm just, you know, that's a great idea. I haven't used it yet. I'm just going to reuse it. It was the magic da flying dagger that, like I had this table and had stuff. And the minute you touch the dagger, it's like this AC2, you know, 1D4 hit point flying creature that's attacking the party. And they were like, oh, ah! and it was a room full of magic treasures and gems and things. It was like a wizard's study. They just left. They didn't know how what it was going to, you know, it was like, it was just a dagger. It just did one to four damage, but they were convinced it was just going to brutalize them. And they were just like, okay, we're out of here, you know? And, and that's the point is like, you want to have things that players go like, you know, we're going to take a buy on that one. We're out of here if they find it. And, but yeah, I think, you know, you, you, I don't know. If you get a good idea and the players don't find it, just recycle it somewhere else. You know, um, most players, even if they were, even if you were to take the same idea and recycle it in another room, they probably wouldn't even realize that you just basically copied yourself three months later. So it doesn't matter. Um, um, yeah. I've gone both ways with that. I actually have, I've, I've, I've done that successfully and I've done that unsuccessfully. And I actually have had players recognize but uh, maybe I, maybe I, maybe I could have done it better. Maybe I should have shaken it up more. Well, the difference is is that we used to do. I mean, if you know that you're, let's say you're doing the scenario based, um, like the Temple of the Frogs type scenario. Like we're going to go down there. We have a, an express purpose for being here. We're going down to the the Temple of the Shiny Monkey Statue. We know they've got the Shiny Monkey Statue down there, and it's magical and powerful. It's some great artifact. Well, if it's really hidden, which it should be. Um, that means we got to keep going back till we find it because we know it's there and we know they have it. We just haven't found it yet, right? And by the same token, um, if you're doing like a mega dungeon, the whole point, you know, back in the day, the, the discovery of the dungeon created a, a real fascination with the experience of the, and I think it's what Paul's talking about, the gothic horror experience. Um, we still, 
we were watching all these old black and white movies and there was that feeling from those old Vincent Price movies. And so it's very titillating and there's that whole sense of we're exploring, we're discovering places. Um, oh, my cat's sneezing. Um, poor guy. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know how loud it is on camera. It's like, it's really it's loud. It's pretty loud. I, I think we just discovered where the Wanda Furballs came from, frankly. Yeah, that's the Wanda Furballs. Yeah, Franco. No, he actually isn't much of a puker. He's more of a sneezer. Um, oh, dear. So anyway, um, where was I going with that? Oh, the mega dungeon thing, though, is, is uh, it, we were so fascinated with that that people did create these mega dungeons. It was It was... Uh, world exploration just didn't seem as compelling as going down to the dungeons the way it was presented in, in early on. Um, and so every DM had a mega dungeon that they started. I mean, I might have started with just one to three levels. My first dungeon, I, it ended up being nine levels. It was just like a couple levels at first on a couple scraps of, like I, you know, I just had scraps of uh, graph paper torn out of a book. I didn't think it would go any further than that. Next thing I know, it's like these are the first levels of this mega dungeon that's nine levels levels deep, and I got a card file with cards for every room, with with the descriptions of everything. Um, and so, uh, finding secret doors is that that's the other thing about finding secret doors is they sh players shouldn't always find the secret door because if they're if they're trying to sort of if they're doing like a campaign against the the underworld. Um, they're going to keep coming back. And so this time, maybe they didn't see it, but maybe next time, you know, or another group of adventurers will come across it and find it and explore that area. Um, I think the concerns around that, around the, the, the notion of, I mean, I like the idea that the players are going to continue to come back. That, like if they're in the Golden Monkey Temple, they know the Golden Monkey's in there somewhere. But I feel yeah. like that really only works when you're talking about the context of an ongoing campaign where time is theoretically infinite. Right where you're going, we're going to play forever, as far as we know, or until we're just so bored, right, or, right. or you know, whatever somebody else takes over. And the, the context of that problem really shifts when you start talking about convention games or tournament games or anything where it's time limited. Right? Suddenly, everybody's very well. Unhappy. I think that you have to understand that your one four hour mm -hmm. session. Yeah, the, 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 the pay, you're talking about payoffs. There. I mean, I see people yeah. talking, I like, there are all these new terms that I see. I just was on looking at something on Twitter and somebody was talking about, they talk about all these story terms and like, we've got to create stories and we need to make sure the players have this and that and, you know, payoffs. I mean, in screenwriting, they're like payoffs, I think is what they call them. It's like, you know, uh, um, and, and I don't think it's relevant. I think that you have a real world setting and you create these things and, and, uh, if they find it, they find it. If they don't, they don't. I'm, I mean, I'm trying to think. There's a giant oak tree in our neighborhood. Or no, it's not an oak tree. It's a cottonwood. And I was walking over to visit Chris. And one night I came back um, from there and uh, I spotted this tree. And it, I was just like, this is gigantic. This is the biggest tree I've ever seen. Right. And it was like this man. I like I found. And then uh, weeks later, uh, I, I took my girlfriend to see it. And the lady who lived next door happened to come out her door and she was like, that's uh, Elwood or something like that. Like the tree has a name. She's like, he is the tallest tree in Denver, Colorado. He's like, and she was like 80 years old. And she was like, I have this photograph of me as a baby. My parents are holding me. I'm two years old and he's huge already. Wow. And, and, uh, um, and my, so my point with that is that I had walked by that tree a million times and not seen it. And, and I just happened to be walking at night and the light was just perfect. I mean, it looks like the sort of tree the elves would build their little platforms in and live in. You know, the thing is just enormous. And um, um, and so, yeah, I mean, if, you know, you create it here and they don't find it, they don't find it. I don't care. I, I got so many ideas. I mean, I got more ideas than I can run my players through, you know. Um, I mean, how many, you know... How many encounters can your players go through and how many encounters have you created in all your time playing RPGs? Like how many of them, you know, do you just, I, I think there's a desire to use them up when you're new, but when you get older, you're like, I don't care. I'll just, I'll use it with somebody else, you know? Um, so I, I am totally against that whole, like, it's like, why even bother having a secret door? If you always open the secret door, there's no point to that. Um, 
Um, which is kind of my big complaint with like 5e perception checks is they've made it too easy to find things. You know, you get six players who have really good perception ability. They're all rolling together. Somebody's going to spot the, the Guga. Um, and so, um, yeah, this, you know, what's the point? It's, I, I like the, uh, and, the, and this is just a, 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 a difference in, in, it's a stylistic difference in how we play. In the old way, or in the more traditional manner, um, we like a more uh, we like to gamble. You know, it's like yeah, more of an all or nothing. Sense. We're going to Vegas, you know, the haunted house with the Vegas feeling. I mean, when you nail it, it's like when you run into a bad monster and your odds of hitting it are really bad, but you just nail it and and you hit it for lots of damage. You know, it's just like oh. I, I agree that those are the memorable times. The memorable times are yeah. times when something, frankly, shouldn't have happened and did. And those are the, the those I think for me, those are the times that I actually remember. You know, right, so as right. we get into like the last ten minutes that we have available here, so we got some. You know, we I got uh, hours. Comments. I think you guys are the ones with we, time issues, but. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, I, I, I think you, we know that you have stuff you need to do, Griff. Um, no, no, the, um, this is it. Like so, you said, are you going to do a show with us? And I was like, <laughs> I like got my calendar and I blocked out eight hours. I'm going to be on their show. We're doing a marathon. Well, well, maybe you could join us in the Discord chat perhaps afterwards that we have with our people. Uh, yeah, if we, I can um, figure out how to use Discord. Send me a link. I'll join you. Okay, we'll try, we'll try to make that happen. There anyway. That, it'll explain why, why my Twitter feed goes dead after this. They're all in your Discord chat, Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, so I got to, um, among the comments I'm looking at. So John Miller is is you know a pr giving high praise to the Tonisborg product, and he's asking. The, the main thing is John's got a comment. I can only see half of it, unfortunately. He's got a question about Greg right. using the random uh, generator developed by Arnis, and we we touched on that briefly so john if you could like write the 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 rest of your question again for me to see maybe we could get that to griff but um uh a, a little while ago it's lost here, I, I think mean, i know what you're gonna say arneson I, made I some gonna say this. right right and cal so wants to know when cal the starter starts um right. we're about to start it we just need to iron out one little thing and we thought we would try doing a 5e expansion for it so we're waiting for the guy um the guy it's our buddy Bob Welton. He does um, 5e modules and stuff. Um, so we're waiting for Bob to get back to us and let us know sort of the parameters of that before we can submit it for approval. And then once Bob gets back to us and we add that text into the Kickstarter, we're launching it and we're going to go. Um, Great. And at that point, and we're not really on a timeline because you have to submit it for approval. That could be like three days. I don't know. It could be 30 minutes for all I know. They just... Um, they have to look at what you're doing to make sure you aren't a bad person. Um, and so uh, <laughs> there are a lot of bad people. In RPG. Yeah, we're really bad. We like do Kickstarters and we actually fulfill them. Um, <laughs> there are a lot of people not fulfilling Kickstarters out there. And I'm like, didn't you have a product before you started the thing? It's like, no, we're going to develop it now when we get the money. Yeah. No. Yeah. no. We have, and is this one going to be the same uh, design? Is it going to be another hard copy, hard cover printing, or will it be soft cover this time? Maybe we have. Well, each edition is unique because of like just sourcing problems, right? So the purples. Okay. Um, uh, we were going to do all purple. We had to do some teal because we couldn't source fib uh, fabric for those. Um, so there are some teals also, and then there are black covers. Um, these are the red cover ones that we sold through our website. Um, they were on there for about a year. People had to wait a year to get the printing. Once we got enough orders, we did a printing. And these are different because they have red cover with the gold, and they have like 80-pound paper instead of 70-pound paper like yours does because we couldn't get 70-pound paper for the life of us. It was just like we're waiting like a month for paper. And finally, the printer was like, you want to do... So they actually, these cost more to, to, to make because the paper was heavier, and, they, and they're thicker. I mean... I got a well, I don't I got a pile of books here, but it's thicker, you know. And so the next printing, what we're doing is um we're gonna have we we over ordered since we were worried about being able to get more. And so the Kickstarter will have a small supply of we're gonna sell a couple purples at a premium price. So we're gonna sell one black cover, which only twenty were made of those, twenty-five were made of those at an even more premium premium price. And uh but you'll have, we'll also have these red covers as a, um, 
a quick ship. So we've got like about 80 that we can quick ship. So the first 80 people, for the same price as a regular one, you can get a quick ship that's already ready to go. Um, and then the other ones, people will have to just wait till they're fabricated based on orders. And uh, hopefully that'll go on the faster side. Um, we don't know. I mean, we're dealing with with a with an industry that is sort of dying. You know, the the hardbound book, the real the handmade hardbound book industry is dying. Um, and and there aren't very many people that can do that. So if we put in like if the Kickstarter is really successful, let's say we do a thousand orders for that, it might be a couple months before someone gets their book because we just don't have the people to manufacture these. <laughs> you know, we don't have a giant assembly line. It's like three people. Um, so, uh, but you know, I mean, I, I don't know everybody I talk to when they see this, they're like, oh yeah, I've got D and D and Pathfinder books that pretty much exploded a couple months after I got it. And these things right. are not going to do that. Um, these are really well made. Um, so, I mean, I'll let you guys talk about it. I mean, you I got a copy, you, you look at it. It's, it's a, it is a real book. It is not, um, uh, print on demand garbage with a cardboard cover. Um, I agree. It's among it's among the nicest printed books that I in my library, honestly. And I I love the original uh, versions of Greg's uh, maps and the expanded versions and Dan's rule set at the end. And it's a it, it is a super nice product. It really is. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the old the old D and D the AD and D books, they they are still. Um, I have one that is like in pristine condition. My monster yep. manual that's got so much play, but it is still the binding is still solid, and it is. You know, it is a nice book. Um, so you know the old, the old, the old methods really is proof that they hold up. Um, That's so, what books were for at one point. <laughs> yeah, you know, archival papers and and uh, yeah. you know, yeah, and 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 well, and gonna... real craft people assembling it by hand so that each one is quality controlled by you know, it's not just killing through a. Yep. A machine. It's, it's a gorgeous, it it's a gorgeous head. book, Griff. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in here though and say we're, we are just about out of time here. Did, is there any last? Well, what happens when we go overtime? Like Thomas if we go overtime, what happens? Is there uh, I like just a, cut straight to credits. I just, oh, <laughs> nope. <laughs> okay. Well, look for Fate Kickstarter. Black, Hopefully, <laughs> in this next week, we'll have it activated. It'll be really up to, up to Kickstarter when they approve it. The minute we get approval, we'll go, go live. Um, awesome. And if you want to get a book that's uh, already made and have it shipped right away when the Kickstarter ends. There's, this doesn't cost more. There's going to be like 80 books available plus the three purples and one black. Um, and then what else? I mean, that's it. You know, I feel like I say the same things every time I'm on, but um, I appreciate you guys having me on. I watch Paul. He's like looking at his screen. So he looks so disinterested. <laughs> you should put the screen over. So at least, or put it so you look like you're looking at my window because you're always just kind of looking off to the side all dejected. <laughs> this is a great show. Yeah, Paul's yeah. running a lot of technology. Uh, you know, Paul has a lot of, a lot of Paul <laughs> runs all the tech, audio, video, time, you everything. Just kind of let him be on screen or something. You should I, put up an I icon could not for Paul. juggle all the things that Paul does on a daily basis. <laughs> and I sent so, you other uh, images. But, Can you at least put some other images up from the book? Like, I know we're almost at an hour, but you started late. I got, I got another five minutes. You started late. <laughs> um, but that's, can you just throw some of the have. other stuff up there that we have? Because you threw I, the map. I, I, that's, but, every, yeah. that's everything from the sample. That's everything from the sample that was that was sent over uh, the other day. So like that's, unfortunately, PDF, at the moment, you had the whole like you had the, the index. It's only got you two the, images uh, in it. <laughs> yeah, but the index is full of like the headers on the index. Like that should be full screen. You should look at the index. That's the cool, we, you, cool part I'd, of it. I say that we have a link to your website in the uh, description uh -huh. on YouTube with all the other stuff you've got, and people should go uh, follow the link over to yeah. the Secrets of Blackmore site. Get on the mailing list. See all that other stuff that we're talking yeah. about. Yeah, the, there's 80 oh. books that are going to be pre uh, pr uh, quick ship, and if you're not on the mailing, like that's the first place we're going to like hammer is the mailing list. So if you get on the mailing list, you'll be the first to know. I got to get in there and get a quick ship before anybody else does. Um, is there anything I missed when we talked about all this? Because we kind of babbled a lot. I think we got it. Viewers, that's, yeah, I, th I think we're good. Viewers, if, if you're looking for those links, they should be in the description of the uh, video here on YouTube. Uh, and certainly we will, uh, 
update or, or watch our channel for updates as the Kickstarter goes live. We'll make sure to get that information out to you as, as soon as it's available. And all those people out there uh, that are like, oh, don't kill my character, it's character building to like experience yeah. character death a lot. So yeah. and there's a pun intended in that. Um, it's good <laughs> to lose and learn to come back. Like Most people that are successful fail a lot before they succeed. There's no like easy, easy ride. So I learn. Agree. And of course, learn viewers should remember that uh, you can like, follow, and subscribe to us, the Wandering DMs. Uh, and we're on YouTube and Twitch and Twitter and Facebook and GitHub and TikTok. And we have the handle Wandering DMs on all of the sites. So you should uh, follow us there and get updates on uh, great guests like Griff Morgan. And the next time we have another great guest on. Wait, 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 wait. I, you can't just cut me off. You can't just cut me off. I got to show you my favorite art in here. We got a lot of good art. We got a lot of good art, but there's one. Well, there's well, two. Well, looks like. for the image here, viewers. If you prefer to listen Definitely. to our shows in audio well, like podcast format, lot. you can get this those podcasts at can our website it? at wanderingdms.com. Okay, right. he's going to cut me off any second now. Like, there's all this <laughs> cool art in here. Oh, you can also find too. our podcasts on sites such as Google Podcast, iTunes, Spotify. Uh, if you are listening to us on one of those sites right now, please take a moment to rate and review us on that site. That helps other users Ooh. of that site Von find Allen, us. And he does really a comic book. It. This is good. It does. Oh, uh, Von does. Allen. Look for Von Allen comics. Among he's the really reasons good. why we keep to a good schedule is we always have after show chat with our patrons who support Wandering DMs. And boy, we really I appreciate their support a lot. If um if uh if you're new to the show and you want to join them, please go to patreon.com slash wandering DMs. And uh, Paul and I are always there at about 10 past the hour to uh, continue the discussion live with our viewers. And we'll look forward to that. You know, other shows coming up this week, actually, uh, I'm going to be back tomorrow night uh, playing uh, Pool of Radiance, other gold box games, and new show Thursday night, Thursday at 8 p.m. I'm going to be back with Book of War Season 3 for more war game action uh, here in the house with a brand new opponent uh, for Season 3. So so we, lo we just like Griff, we all love war gaming. So look for that Thursday night on the Wandering Names channel. Um, Are you Griff, invite me to the Discord. I'll come. We'll try to make send that happen. Me. All right, send we'll me try to make that happen. Hopefully, we can rip rope uh, no. Griff in for uh, for more chat on the Discord. Thank you so much for making time today, Griff. I wish we had more time. No, thanks for having me back. Just an hour. Awesome. How can we get anything done in an hour? It goes real fast. Uh, don't forget, we are live every Sunday at one p.m. Eastern time. So we hope you'll join us again next week for another thought-provoking discussion. We'll see you then.